this class, it's AP Gov. So we're learning about how the government works, what things influence it, and what people take, like what actions they take to influence it and affect the lives of the population. Civics is the study of how our system of government operates, um, both the role of citizens within that process and how the different institutions of government interact with each other. Um, and it's critically important for students to learn. In U.S. history, students have to take a U.S. history end of course exam um, that counts as 20% of their final grade in the course. That's a statewide standardized assessment. For civics, what state law requires is for students to take 10 questions off the U.S. citizenship test prior to graduation. Um, but they do not have to pass those 10 questions, and those 10 questions can vary from district to district. It's up to the district to choose which questions they administer. Um, so it is more of an exposure requirement than it is an actual aptitude or achievement requirement. Last Friday, um, we, we, some of you read an article entitled Free Feeding Frenzy, and it talked about how one specific historic moment in modern American history is kind of the dividing line in the relationship between the press and government. What's the event? Watergate, Watergate excellent. So how does Watergate change the relationship between the press and the government? A lot of it is about giving students time and space to think critically about what they're consuming. Um, our students are already active consumers of information through social media um, in particular. So they're, they're aware of it, they're exposed to it, but what they need is the time and space to think about what they're looking at. So I, I try to make sure that my course is to the greatest extent possible inquiry based. It's more me posing questions for students to wrestle with than it ever is about me interjecting uh, views, beliefs, or, or opinion that could be interpreted as fact that I never want to go down that path. What, what else happens as a result? How does it have an impact on, on reporters and the press in terms of their approach to covering the federal government? And what is the, at least the author of the article last Friday argued that there is an incentive for the press post Watergate. What's the incentive? What are they trying to do? Yeah, to be the next Woodward and Bernstein, to be the one who breaks the next Watergate. And so you get this investigative approach that develops post Watergate to try to expose corruption or misdeeds or, or the next big breaking thing. The curriculum standards for AP government require students to wrestle with issues of media literacy, of potential bias in the way information is presented. So in my course, I don't go about it by saying this particular source is biased, this is not. What we did in class instead is we watched the first five minutes of four different news outlets from the exact same day and simply allowed students to watch those five and then guide discussion around what are the similarities you saw? What are the differences you saw? What are driving those differences? Why do you think that's occurring? And in wrestling with those questions, students begin to exercise the muscles of being able to critically evaluate the information presented to them. And ultimately, that's what I want as a teacher because I cannot possibly equip them to navigate every environment they're going to face. My students today are dealing with TikTok my students five years ago were not. And so the students five years ago, if all I had done is said, here are the news sources and this is what you need to know, today, as citizens in their mid-20s, they would be completely unprepared for what is, in many cases, the dominant source of news for young Americans. So I need to provide my students with opportunities to engage in critical analysis, and then they can apply those skills to any information source that they're going to encounter today or into the future as a citizen. Um, so, yeah, look at that. I mean, it's, it's high quality stuff. So for a whole weekend, I'm building Snapchat story for the Department of Education. This is the content you always knew that you needed, but you didn't have. It was pretty, secretary showing up with, that, that's protective services. So it's five and a half minutes of high quality content. So here's the problem though. What the, the department and the Obama administration didn't fully think through. They thought they were gonna be hip and trendy and wonderful, but what is the problem with Snapchat in a world of Freedom of Information Act requests? Why is that a problem, Trey? Because I don't, it's going from my screen to 
It's exactly right. The problem with Snapchat is it disappears and all of it is public record. So this becomes the tool for the watchdog press is that yes, you have first amendment freedom to publish information, but you also have a legal right to request the information. And if, if you ask for it, it's got to be turned over. Like as a kid and like as you're growing up, you usually base your views off of like what your parents believe first um, and what you like your family members like tie into. So I feel like by taking classes like this and courses, you can try to build your own belief and like your own thoughts of what happened. So like taking this course, I've been able to like see more of like what goes on to like different sides of politics and like what they actually believe in and how our like government officials and like our president will lectures. Um, like what their process is to actually make us like vote to what we want to vote for. What's powerful about civics education at the high school level is it is relevant to students, especially if you take the time to help students see the connections. So, you know, it's, it's easy, I think, in an election year to make this relevant because I'm teaching high school seniors. Every single one of them is going to be 18 by November of 2024, which means all of them are eligible to vote, not just in the November election, they're eligible to vote in February in the presidential primaries, even if they're 17, because in South Carolina, you can vote as a 17 year old in a primary if you're 18 by general election day. And so the civics course gives students an opportunity to understand the nuts and bolts of just the election process as a starting place, but because it is relevant to them, because they can see themselves fitting within that civics framework as a voter, as an engaged citizen, um, it becomes learning that is more enriching for them, um, and hopefully it's something that's going to be beneficial to them throughout life as an informed citizen who's actively participating in their community.